In April of 2006, the Wilkes County Commissioners appointed a committee to work toward collecting, preserving, and making Wilkes County history available in DVD format, and to prepare to celebrate the county's 230th birthday in 2008. How did it all happen? Who did it? You know, the good and the bad. The, the railroad story is just fascinating. Um, it's got good and it's got the tough times. You are asked to share your history by contacting the Wilkes Community College Library. The Revolutionary War's emphasis on freedom and equality led to further debates regarding granting slaves their freedom. In 1775, Lord Dunmore proclaimed that all indentured servants and slaves joining the army would be freed. With promises of freedom from both the American and British armies, many slaves ran away to join. Enslaved blacks were more likely to join the British, while free blacks joined the Continental Army. In 1850, there were 958 slaves in Wilkes County, and 1,208 by 1860. Many of the blacks took the surnames of their former owners when they were freed and are listed in the 1870 census. They both were slaves. My daddy was, he was nine years old when the black people were set free. Uh -huh. And my mother, I believe she was four. So. And they, they were born into slavery, weren't they? Yes, yeah. Their mom and daddies were slaves. That's right, yeah. Well, do you know who owned her? Uh, the Ferguson, the Fergusons owned her. My father, but, uh, in, uh, I'm not, I'm not right sure who owned my mother. My grandfather especially has a very interesting history uh -huh. in that he was actually sold on the slave block when he was eight years old and taken at the end of the Civil War, I pick up the story that he's told yeah. me. Uh -huh. He was in Texas, and he came back home, and someone is, appears was with him. And um, it makes me think that his father may have passed on by this time, mm -hmm. because his mother was hesitant mm -hmm. to invite him in. Yeah. But knowing my, having lived in the home with my grandfather and having known him over a period of years, he would never allow anybody of any color stay out in the elements overnight. Uh -huh. He had to make a pallet for the sleep off. Uh -huh. When he came to his mother's door, this is after the Civil War, she was hesitant to invite him in. He finally said, well, wouldn't you uh, take in your son? She said, is that you, George? And it reminds me of the story of David, not of David, but of Joseph. Yeah. Well, now, he was, he was sold oh. as a slave on the block. Do you know where this was? I would think at the courthouse, I would think. Oh, yeah, here in the Wilkesburg, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Because he Let me share, because my mother was, uh, her, her father was actually a slave, so that's how far that I can go back. Uh, her father was taken away when he was uh, eight years old and uh, was separated for some period of years. I'm not sure where he was at, but uh, when he came back into this town, uh, he came to his mother and uh, I don't know if he asked her, said, I'd like to stay here, or I'd like to spend some time with you. And she, and she really didn't have anything. She said, well, I'm not able to keep anybody else. His question to her was, would you turn your own son away? And I think at that point she just broke down and said, there's no way that I would turn him away. But she had not seen him since he was eight years old. So that, you know, that has always reached into my memory, you know, what it done to separate families. The only thing that I, as close as I can get, is my great-great-grandfather. My mother's grandfather was a slave in Warren River, and he actually ran away uh, and um, joined the Union Army and came back to Wilkes County as a free man. I always heard there's about a thousand acres in gear that belong to uh, uh, Nathan Horton, and he the story goes that that he went to Mississippi. I was told this by a, uh, a, a, a black 
man over here by the name of Gene Horton. And he said that his ancestor was a slave bought on the, the block in Mississippi. They called him, he was known as a, as a, as a buck Negro. And uh, the Hortons were not, were not uh, people that were mean to their slaves. I, I, I've never heard no rumor of anything about that. But anyway, he said that, uh, that this uh, Nathan Horton bought a wife for him also and brought him back here. And from those two, uh, he uh, eventually had several slaves. And, and when he died, the, mu the wife gave the black people over there after the Civil War, the freeing of the slaves, gave them several hundred acres of land over there. And my brother Tim still, uh, he owns a piece of that land now that, that they own. Uh, he bought a piece of it several years ago. One of the early supporters of the Underground Railroad was Levi Coffin, who was born in the Guilford County Quaker community of New Garden in 1789. Coffin hid runaways in his home as early as 1819 and helped many slaves reach the West. Judith Barber, born in 1820, came to Wilkes as a slave in 1844 and is a central figure in the history of black people of Wilkes County. The family believes she came from Virginia. The slaves at that time were often given the surnames of their masters. The Reverend Richard Wainwright Barber, minister of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Wilkesboro, later moved his family to a plantation where Rain Sturdivant Funeral Home is now located off Armory Road in North Wilkesboro. It was originally the center of a slave plantation, but in 1855 it was transformed into a private school mainly for girls. Judith became a midwife and was known as Mammy Judy. She had 13 daughters, nine of whom reached maturity, and they all inherited her love of music and midwifery. This Judith was a powerful woman in that she left so many strengths with so many people, and the white keepers or the people who had her when she was getting up in years and nearer the last, they, they got angry with the family because they went and got her. Uh -uh, they wanted to keep her. It was, she was like a mother. And when she became too old to serve as the midwife, they brought her to sit in the room and give directions and to talk and to take care of this mother waiting for the baby. Elizabeth Gritton, formerly of Lincoln Heights Road, was a direct descendant of Judith Barber. She and other descendants prepared a book called Treasure Troves, detailing the history of the Judith Barber family up until the present day. Dr. Linda Veltze, professor of library science at Appalachian State University writes of Elizabeth Grinton, when I met her I realized that Elizabeth Grinton's years were numbered and that according to the African proverb, when an old person dies, a library is burned. How to document the incredible life of Judith Barber and the mesmerizing mission of Elizabeth Grinton to unite her large extended family and let them understand that though enslaved through no fault of her own, Judith was a woman to be proud of, someone to honor, someone to inspire coming generations. One of the oldest families listed in the 1870 U.S. Census was Jackson Brown. Jackson was a slave in Wilkesboro, North Carolina, who married Patsy, a white indentured servant originally from Switzerland. John Douglas Brown, son of Jackson and Patsy Brown, fought and was wounded in the Civil War in 1862. Several black men served in the Civil War. Abraham Petty was born a slave on this plantation owned by Benjamin Martin in Roaring River. He heard that Union soldiers were expected to be in Wilkesboro and made sure he was there when they arrived. Petty rode off with them. He was about 30 years old at the time. By 1850, there were approximately 1,194 slaves in Wilkes County and 224 free people of color. The majority of free blacks worked in unskilled jobs. Most were tenant farmers. Some were skilled as blacksmiths, brick masons, carpenters, seamstress, shoemakers, spinsters, 
or washerwomen. Unskilled labor included domestic, farm laborer, and servants. Molly Harris and her husband and, not, as I remember, four sons came from Culpeper, Virginia. That was the beginning of the Harris clan. One of her sons, J. Hugh Harris, married Clarice Choppers and settled in the community south of the Wilkesboro's, where he purchased hundreds of acres of land ranging from the Yadkin River to the Brushy Mountains. When Jim Crow came, I was very involved with that. I remember many harsh things that were done, and it was but yet we all knew that we could not participate in certain things and we couldn't go in certain places. And it has been many times it was very embarrassing. Back then we, um, when we went to vote, our intelligence was questioned. At restrooms and water fountains, at signs white only or colored only. And we were expected to call white people Mr. or Mrs. And when we worked tobacco fields, when it was time for lunch, the whites ate first, and we ate what was left. Swimming pools were white only. And if we got to go somewhere on a bus, we had to sit in the back, and we was called ugly names for no reason at all. You could either be accepted and go on, or you could be ugly and be hurt. So we just accepted it. Yes, I remember. Uh, the Jim Crow era, especially coming to town, is what we used to call it from Boomer, and we would come to the Liberty movie theater, and uh, we would always pay for our tickets like everybody else did, but then we would have to go over to the alley and go up the steps and go into the balcony area. The so-called Jim Crow laws were more than a series of rigid anti-black laws. It was a way of life. African Americans were relegated to the status of second-class citizens. Blacks and whites were not to socialize with each other and were definitely not to date or marry one another. I guess that's the nature of man, mankind, I'm speaking now, where somebody decides, I deserve better than they do, and if I can do it, I'll then I get the best.